Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Gordon Takaki. I am the president of the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for coming tonight for this very important and informational event. I want to thank the candidates for being here this evening. We, it's very good that you could join with us so we can present to the people of Hawaii Island or this side of the island for their, uh, so that we can form good opinions about where we stand, on the, uh, where you stand on the different issues. So thank you very much for being here. We'd like to also thank some of the sponsors for tonight's event, and I'll start off with the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce, the Japanese Chamber of Commerce Industry of Hawaii, Hawaii Island Realtors, Hawaii Island Contractors Association, Kanoe Lehua Industrial Area Association, and the Hawaii Island Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. We also want to thank the Arc of Hilo, Pepe Romero of CJ's Promotion, Big Island Video News, News West Broadcasting, Radio Station KPUA and KWXX, and various media and news folks, and the numerous volunteers. At this time, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the Arc of Hilo, Michelle Shoroishi. Aloha, and thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you, Gordon, and as he mentioned, my name is Michelle Hiraishi, and I am the CEO and president here at the Arc of Hilo. I have been here one month, so Kalamai, if I look at my notes to remind myself of a few things. But if you didn't know, the Arc of Hilo was actually established in 1954, so we've been here quite a while. I actually argue with my big sister on the mainland. She says that North Dakota was the first arc, and I argue and say, no, no, Arc of Hilo was the first arc. So I'm going to carry that legacy regardless of whether it's true or not, yeah? The Arc of Hilo currently has 83 employees, and although we are a standalone 501c3 entity, we're also a member of the na nationwide network of independent arc chapters. Our mission here at the Arc of Hilo is to improve the quality of life for people with developmental and other disabilities through recreational, educational, vocational, and life skills training. We strive to empower folks with disabilities to overcome their life challenges through their, our diverse programs. For example, we have our client support services, which includes an adult health, day health program that they learn excuse me, that is a critical lifeline that connects our clients with friends. So they actually come here to our facility and have activities throughout the day. They connect with other folks. They have lunch together. And as I mentioned, they really, really gain some friendships through that program. We provide center-based activities for that program as well as community-based activities. It, within our client support services, we also have personal assistance component. And what that does is actually t helps take our clients out into the community where they gain life skills and make connections for, with resources that are available to them. The biggest component at this point at the, of the Arc of Hilo is our commercial services. In that case, our goal is to create jobs in a diverse set of industries that are not dependent on tourism. We are the largest employer of people with disabilities in Hawaii County, so I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah? And we obviously contribute significantly to our island's workforce. We have a yard maintenance services, so any folks that would like their yards maintained, please look us up. We have very, very reasonable rates. Our guys are very good, and they will come to you and pretty much do, other than tree trimming, we can really, really handle the, the um, jobs that you give us, yeah? We have janitorial services, and that we offer a lot for like our government agencies and do a lot of cleaning downtown at the county building, at the police building, um, and, and that is actually our biggest component. We hire the most folks in that services. We have laundry services that we do right here on, on site. We're always in need of new um, equipment, so if anybody would like to donate a washer or a dryer, bring it on. We will absolutely accept that. And what you, where you guys are sitting this evening is in our job creation center. Um, what you guys call the event center here for us, it's actually jobs that we create for our clients to get some skills and training in the hospitality industry. So everything that you see done here tonight, with the exception of the board, helps to set up the stage. Um, the flowers, the chairs, the table setting is all done by our clients. 
as a way to gain those skills. Huh? So uh, again, the, the event center for you, the job creation center for us, is available for rent. We do have brochures back at our snack shop there. Um, please feel free to grab one and look us up. And if you also get hungry outside, please don't forget their saucy dogs. Um, that is not necessarily part of the ARC, but they are certainly here to support us and to make sure everybody stays fed during tonight's activity. So again, thank you folks so much for coming tonight. Please spread the word. ARC of Hilo is here. Um, we are available, and we hope folks seek us out. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, let's get the forum started. At this time, I'd like to introduce this evening's moderator, Sherry Bracken. She's with Mahalo Broadcasting Lava 105.3 FM and Kekoa 107.7 FM radio, hosting a weekly interview program, Island Issues, plus daily event updates. She's contributed to Big Island News for Hawaii Public Radio since 2005, and also works with Big Island Video News. Sherry and her husband moved here from San Francisco in 1994. She's a member of the Big Island Press Club and was named Hawaii Women's Hall of Fame and last year was named Small Business Administration, Small Business Advocate for Media for the State. Ladies and gentlemen, Sherry Bracken. Don't forget to take oh, you're not gonna... Aloha. Thank you so much for being here, just to echo what everybody else has said. We will conclude our forum at 8 o'clock, promptly. If you would like to silence your cell phones or any other noisemakers, that would be an excellent idea. And if not, the Arc of Hilo would welcome your $10 donation. I got that idea from the YWCA. If you need to use the restrooms, the women's restroom is out that door in that direction. The men's restroom is out this door in this direction. And I'd like to note that this is being live streamed at KWXX FM Facebook page. And we are really, really pleased that it's airing live on the radio on KPUA 670 AM. Thanks to the support from Chris Leonard, Ken Hupp, and G. Cruz for that. And if you forget anything these candidates say tonight, starting tomorrow, you may see a recap of it at BigIslandVideoNews.com. Chad Blair is here with Civil Beat. You can read his interpretation. And Nancy Cook Lauer with West Hawaii Today in the Tribune Herald. So you can see how they felt about it. And I mention that because it's really important that we're voting for governor in this primary election. And it's important to hear what they say and understand who they are from many different sources. I've attended several candidate forums, as you might imagine moderated several of them, and I learn something new from these candidates every single time. Before we go on, I think it's very appropriate, given what has happened this week, that we recognize that our Hawaii County Police Department has been under more than extreme stress. We are very grateful that the perpetrator is no longer among us, and let's have a moment of silence for Officer Bronson Kaliloa. Thank you so much for that. And I do understand that the officer who was wounded today is over in Honolulu, but I hear that he does not have life-threatening injuries, so that's all good news. And so hopefully our island can begin to return to a, a more normal state. I would like to especially note that you can have a fabulous forum with terrific candidates, but if you can't hear them, you don't know anything. And Pepe Romero over there is like the best sound guy in the universe. Thank you so much, Pepe, for being here. And another thing about forums, I think they're great fun because I don't have to really answer tough questions. But the purpose of these forums is so you get information and so you know what you want to do. And that means don't forget to vote. If you are not registered, you may register and vote at both walk-in voting between July 30th and August 9th. You may also register and vote on voting day, August 11th. And all of the information you need is at elections.hawaii.com. Gov. And note that for the walk-in voting at the five different locations, you can go to any one of them no matter where you live or may be registered. Alpuni Center here in Hilo, Pahala Community Center, West Hawaii Civic Center, Waimea Community Center, and Pahoa Community Center.
And also note that the election includes both partisan races. The governor race is a partisan race where you will have to make a decision whether you want to vote for Green Party candidates, Republicans, Democrats, but there's also nonpartisan races, and those are the county council races. And everybody will vote for county council. So whatever you think about voting, please vote on the day that you need to. Now, the other thing that we're going to do tonight as we hear from our candidates is we're going to be timing them. And so I want you to know that we will be very strict on the timing, as they well know. I'm going to now introduce our candidates, and I'd like to ask you to hold your applause until we've introduced each one of them. Starting from the left over here, we have Democratic United States Representative Colleen Hanabusa, who is running for governor on the Democratic ticket. She's the great-granddaughter of Japanese immigrants, born in Honolulu and raised in Waianae. She has her bachelor's, master's, and law degree from UH and the UH School of Law. She served in the Hawaii State Senate from 1998 through 2010 and served as Hawaii's first female Senate president. She served in the United States House of Representatives from 2011 through 2015, returned to Hawaii to practice law, and became the member and chair of the Honolulu Rail Authority and then returned to the U.S. House in 2016. She's on the House Committees on Armed Services, Natural Resources, and Science, Space, and Technology. Our second Democratic candidate today is Governor David Ige. Governor Ige was born and raised in Pearl City and is the fifth of six sons. He attended public schools in Pearl City and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he met his wife, Dawn. He worked for GTE Ahoy Intel. He earned his MBA at UH Manoa, and he began his political career in 1985 after being appointed to the State House of Representatives. He was elected to the State Senate in 1994, representing Aiea and Pearl City, and was elected governor in 2014. He and Don have three children. We are also joined tonight by two Republican candidates. First, we have Ray LaRue, who is a retired Marine after serving 30 years and has an extensive operational and command and control background in the Pacific. A helicopter pilot by trade, he commanded a combat squadron at Kaneohe Bay, and he was a pilot for Marine One, meaning he transported presidents. He has vast leadership experience and an operational background. He has worked extensively with multiple local and state government agencies, law enforcement, and other government and private sector organizations. Ray served as the, served as the sis, state assistant superintendent for facilities for the Department of Education, and he is president and chair of the Education Institute of Hawaii. Republican candidate, State House Representative Andrea Tupola has served in the Hawaii House of Representatives, representing Nani Cooley and Ko'olina since 2014. Representative Tupola formerly was a professor of music at Leeward Community College. She graduated from Kamehameha Schools and has a bachelor's and a master's in music from Brigham Young and from UH Manoa, and is working on her PhD. She's married with two children. I'd like you to join me now in welcoming our candidates to Hilo. We had invited one additional candidate who placed well in the polls, Republican candidate John Carroll. He had surgery today, so he was unable to join us. But he said he's okay, just so you know. Our timing tonight is courtesy of Mary Bajir and Glenn Kakamita, and what they will do is they will operate the timing machine, and they will also manually time. So if the timing machine should fail, we've got backup, because we do want to be fair to these candidates. And the speakers will be told in advance how much time they have for each question, and then they'll be given 15-second warning. And at the end of their time, then that's it, and they know that. So candidates, are you ready to begin? Ray, you looked a little hesitant there. <laughs> it's too late, you're here. We agreed by luck of the draw before we started that each candidate for their one minute opening would go in the order that they selected. And Representative Colleen Hanabusa chose to make her one minute opening statement first. Rep Hanabusa. Thank you, Sherry, and our generous sponsors. 
I would also like to express my deep-felt sympathy to the family of Bronson Kaliloa, especially his widow and three children, and let's not forget those who he served with, the police officers of Hawaii Island. Bronson is the first death of a Hawaii Island officer by gunfire. I have a vision of Hawaii as a place where all people, but in particular our kapuna, are safe, healthy, productive, and connected to loved ones. It is said that a society is defined by how it honors its seniors and its youth. And the Hawaii that many of us love is known to do this well. If we preserve our special place called Hawaii, it will be there for all of us. This will take a governor and an administration that is characterized by leadership, accountability, and decisiveness. We can't wait for four years for this to happen. I look forward to tonight's discussion on Thank the issue. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. They know in advance that I'm going to cut them off when the red light goes on, so it's not a surprise. Governor Ige, you have one minute. Aloha. I also wanted uh, to thank all of the Big Island organizations for sponsoring this event tonight. You know, I envision a sustainable Hawaii that's 100% clean, renewable energy for electricity, carbon neutral. It, Hawaii becomes the investment for uh, corporations all across the country to invest in forest restoration, koa and ohia forests. Uh, we have protected our watersheds to ensure forever clean water and our oceans. Coral reefs are bountiful, uh, thriving all around the islands. Our farmers produce 100% of what we eat all across the islands, producing biofuels here on the Big Island, as well as papaya, banana, and many others. I do envision this sustainable Hawaii, a vibrant economy, terrific public schools, a world-class university in so many areas that drives our economy. Thank Look you. forward to Thank you, Governor Ige. Ms. Tupola, Representative Tupola, you have one minute, please. Thank you. Aloha to our friends here in Hilo. We're so grateful to be here. And thank you to Sherry. Thank you to the Chamber. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you for all of those who are participating. My vision for Hawaii is to create a Hawaii where families can call this place home for generations to come. When I first got elected to be a State House representative, I loved serving my community. I loved going out and helping and working alongside community members. And as the years passed by, I started to realize that our state has severe systemic issues, intergenerational poverty, rising homelessness, things that everybody likes to talk about, housing, other issues. But I was convinced that we can't solve these problems in the same mindset in which they were created. We need to have a new mindset, a new perspective of the way that we go about things. And we need to treat our community members like they are assets to the, pro to the solutions and not detriments. That's my vision for Hawaii. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Next, we want to talk about vision. Well, I'm so sorry, Mr. LaRue. I was about to skip you in your one minute opening <laughs> statement. <laughs> one minute, please. Aloha, everybody, and thank you for having me back in Hilo. Uh, my vision for Hawaii, imagine for a minute if you're a school teacher. Imagine you have two young children at home. Imagine the prospect of your children having meaningful employment when they come through the K-12 through system or an undergrad system. Imagine a medium-income family that can afford housing, that can afford health care, can afford soccer, can afford vacations. Imagine that's replicated through the state. Imagine a booming economy not just in Hawaii Island, but throughout the state. Imagine you're the least taxed electorate in the nation. Imagine what's next for Hawaii. Imagine this is you. And imagine my vision for a prosperous Hawaii. Mahalo. Thank you very much. And vision leads us to our next question, which is a two minute question. And it is, we need a leader with a vision for our state. So we'd like, starting with Rep. Hanabusa, to hear what is your long-term vision for the state of Hawaii? It's a two-minute question, please. Thank you. My vision for the state of Hawaii is one where more than anything else, the next generations can stay here. You know, when we did Sustainability 2050, and that was in the year 2008, and my partner in crime is in the back, and that was Senator Russell Kokobung. 
One of the things that we were both struck with was the fact that when we asked those students who were heading off to college, 10 of them, how many of you intend to come back? Not one hand went up. And when we asked them why, they said it's because they don't believe Hawaii has a place for them. They don't have the jobs that they want, and they don't think they'll have a place to live. That is why, after talking to so many of the millennials and so many of our kapuna and so many of the people in the state, I have come to the, to the conclusion that what we need to do is we need to listen better and we need to plan for the people who we want to take care of. That is why I believe that it's important to create a cabinet level position that is representing the Kapuna interests, our seniors and our millennials. Because we for so long think that we know better, we in government. We want to tell everyone what kind of housing they're going to have. We want to tell them what kind of transportation system they're going to have. We want to tell them how they're going to live and what kind of jobs that they want. That is not what they want. They want to say. And if we don't listen to them, as I said in my opening and my vision, we want a Hawaii that they want to be a part of. That is why I think it's so important that we listen and we plan accordingly. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Rep. Hanabusa. Governor David Ige, talk about your vision for the state. Two minutes, please. Aloha. I do envision a sustainable Hawaii with 100% clean renewable energy that actually saves us money from today's prices. We will be carbon neutral, ensuring that corporations from all around the world can choose to invest in carbon capture projects right here in the island allowing us to accelerate restoration of koa and ohia and native forests. We will protect our watersheds to assure clean, fresh water forever and protect our ocean so that they are thriving with ocean life. Our coral reefs will be thriving all around the islands. Farmers will produce 100% of the food that we eat here in the islands and grow biofuel to, to generate clean, renewable energy. Uh, we will be thriving and we will have a system of traditional fish ponds all around the state producing fish and other seafood abundant uh, in traditional sense but, but vacant for many, many years. Our public schools will be the best in the country, thriving with robotics, creative media, um, and every graduate will graduate not only high school, but with college credit so that they can save their families money uh, and go on to higher education if they so desire. We will have a vibrant innovation economy that is driven by the University of Hawaii with world-class programs in so many areas, cancer research, astronomy, agriculture, biofuels, renewable energy, a thriving university that will lead the world uh, we also will be leaders in coding and blockchain and cybersecurity. Those careers and, and industries of the future, which is so important to creating job opportunities that our children love. Aloha. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Talk about your vision for our state. Two minutes, please. Absolutely. When you look at the state of Hawaii, and let's take our public education system for a minute. Uh, it does not rate always at the top of the heap with regards to student achievement. Imagine the 257 public schools, 30 some odd charter schools, that if we're going to graduate our children through a K-12 through system, that they have the promise of meaningful employment coming out of that K-12 through system, and if they are not college bound or in an undergrad program, that they do have that meaningful employment that will allow them to stay here on island. If you look at our economy, it's based on one industry. We have a visitor industry that is extremely thin. It's fragile, it's a mile wide and an inch thick. You people know this better than anybody that one weather event, one natural event, a labor strike can cave that visitor industry in very quickly and that's a very, very large detriment to an economy. If you look at what our kids are learning today and we're teaching them with a one size fits all template, which I would say is a one size fits all nothing. What is the prospect for them coming out of that? If you look at the rate of technology coming out of the mainland right now and even here in Hawaii, look the mobile, revolution that's going on. In other words, how we're getting from point A to point B. 
those technologies that are going to be in the job market five years from now, ten years from now, when our children come out of school, right now we're, test, we're, we're testing them in a standardized format, which is really a very industrial revolution style method of learning. Empowered schools, empowered teachers, and fiscal responsibility with fiscal transparency at all department levels, I think is an absolute fundament of how we get our economy to grow. Uh, imagine your child who also has that, that idea of where technology is going as well. Um, why not be Silicon Hawaii? We've tried that before, but we have not come up with the big ideas and the incentives to bring that kind of industry in Hawaii so that we're not rele relegated to just one industry or going into government, which are the two big employers. Thank you. Thank you. Rep Tupola, two minutes, please, your vision for our state. Thank you. What I said earlier about my vision being that more families can stay in this place they call home for generations to come. It's going to take more than just envisioning it. It's going to take a detailed plan with specific things that are going to be doable in the term of a governor. There are many things that can be done over long periods of time, but we have to talk about what we can feasibly do. So I want you guys to participate with me. The first word we're going to say is housing. Can everyone say that? I kind of hear you. Housing. There we go. Wake up. Here we go. So when we talk about housing, what we're talking about is that the cost of living here in Hawaii is so astronomical that people have to pick up and go somewhere else because they can't afford it. Now, everybody wants to talk about affordable housing, but let's break it down into little bit of bite-sized bite pieces. First off, we need to talk about cutting some of the taxes that are actually weighing down heavy and cutting at the lowest socioeconomic class. We have some of the highest income tax brackets in the nation, and we have the biggest spread of it as well. Are those things that we can handle in the government? Yes, it is. The second thing we need to talk about is supporting local developers, making sure that we're keeping our local dollars here. I would say right here at Sacred Hearts Property in Puna, Bronson Haunga and Gil Aguinaldo, they did it the best. 20 homes, two weeks, and that was a community-based project, and it was for an emergency shelter however it showed us that it can happen which means that it could happen again and again and again if we decided to do that the last thing that you should definitely consider about housing is that we hear a rising number of native hawaiians that are incarcerated that might be homeless but what is it that the government controls that can help native hawaiians with housing DHHL, and we need to talk about the fact that we can't just appropriate money and expect zero homes to come out in one year. We should have an actual amount that we expect to build, and then we should have that many people on the list and not any more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to stick with you, Representative Tupola. One of the issues, well, you, every, you all have touched on the issue of business, and annually the state of Hawaii is deemed by many, many sources to be, if not one of the most, the absolute most difficult place to do business. So take two minutes. What would you do to dramatically change that? You know, people talk in platitudes. We want to change it. Two minutes, we want to know what you can do to dramatically change that perception to make it easier to do business here. Two okay, minutes. everybody say jobs. Can you say that? Let's hear it. Jobs. Okay. Let's talk about the fact that the cost of doing business here, the unnecessary regulations that we have, and the reason why people can't operate local business here and would opt to stay out. Can business corporate taxes be affected by government? Yes, they can. Can capital investment or programs to give starter money affect businesses? Yes, we can do that. Can enterprise zones be increased to encourage business in areas where we want to see more economic opportunity? Yes, they can. The second thing you got to think about when you talk about jobs is that we need higher paying jobs, not just any jobs, higher paying. So we've talked in different types of fields of how we can create a pipeline so that we have more of the higher paying jobs that would keep people here. I just spoke at a cosmetology school, which we only have very few in the state of Hawaii, who actually produce jobs that give $12,000 a month right upon graduation. Could we do more of this? Yes, we can. The third thing we should think about is vocational opportunities and training programs. I have a company in my district called Morisco, and they specifically do shipping and repair of boats. They have 16 jobs available. They go to the job fair. They ask people to apply, but can people have this job without the specialized training? No. 
and they actually offered to do this in the high school, start at a lower level so that these kids can be prepared right out of high school and that they can have a job. And for many of these kids who like to use their hands, who like to get dirty, who want to be in these jobs, we don't have that pipeline created so that more vocational training is available so that these jobs can be filled. Not only is it gonna be Morisco, but other things such as mechanics for airlines, many jobs that we can create that are out there for us to do right now. Thank you, Rep. Topola. Mr. LaRue, if you are a governor, what will you do to dramatically change the situation that currently exists, which is Hawaii is really tough to do business in? It's a two-minute question. Yeah, and, and I would submit to all of you that if you did any analysis, you'd find out that Hawaii is 50th in the nation with regards to being kind to new business or even corporate business coming into the state. If you read uh, a Wall Street Journal article that just posted, the mass exodus of high-tech companies and startups coming out of Silicon Valley are actually moving to states that have incentives that allow those industries to grow. I'm the only one up on this stage that really hasn't had any opportunity in our state government to affect that change, so I really am eager to get in there to start doing that. If you start talking to small business owners, or specifically here in Hilo, and you talk and you ask, what are those inhibitors? for your business. In other words, can you afford to pay your employees $15 an hour, not without cutting their hours drastically? So all the inhibitors to include permitting for small business are there and in place, and I think we can do a pretty good job of, of uh, taking those out. Um, when you start looking at the economy and the jobs, $93,000 a year right now is the median family income of four to not be at what would consider that poverty level. So when you start saying, okay, we're gonna start jobs and you're gonna have jobs at a high pay, that is an astronomical goal. So if you look also at the mass exodus of our teachers leaving the Department of Education, and their, their base salary here in Hawaii is not awful, but when you stack it up against the cost of living for Hawaii, some of those teachers are leaving for the mainland and other districts, even though the pay is lower, that gap between the cost of living and their salary makes it easier for them to live. So I would also look at why not start looking at the jobs that we, or people that we have in jobs in place already, making sure that they have the incentives to stay in place, working with the College of Education, working with some of the tax breaks for teachers, working for, uh, principals and kids coming out of school that also can go into high employment and I am done. So. Yes, you are. Thank you so much for noticing that. Governor David Ige, if you are reelected, you have four years more, what are you going to do to dramatically change the situation which has existed for a very long time? It's hard to do business here in Hawaii. Uh, we do know that small businesses will be creating most of the jobs uh, in the next few years. And so we need to do a better job of supporting small businesses. We have created a number of programs that are targeted at helping small businesses uh, be more successful. Uh, we State has provided uh, a manufacturing uh, incentive grant program to small businesses, uh, targeting small businesses to allow them to expand capacity, develop products, uh, especially for export markets. Uh, we've also been partners with the U.S. Small Business Association in really promoting, um, helping our small businesses uh, all throughout Asia, Japan, Korea, China, to really help them build markets uh, and find markets for their products. And we've been successful in supporting small businesses, selling and increasing the, their product sales through Japan, Korea, China, uh, in those areas. So we do know that we want to help our small businesses uh, develop and expand uh, their product line to sell into uh, other areas. We've had a number of other uh, programs to help small businesses grow. Uh, for a number of years we, we've had and we expanded the Small Business Innovation Research Grant Program, which is a grant program that allows and su supports uh, investments in small businesses who have competed for federal grants and actually been successful and these state grants help them 
develop more infrastructure so that they can create more research and development jobs that allows us to create additional jobs uh, here in the islands. And we have a thriving group of accelerators here in our islands, Blue Startups, Elemental Accelerator, Accelerate UH, uh, which have created over the last several years more than 145 new companies and attracted $250 million in capital. Thank you, Governor Ige. Rep Hanabusa. What are you going to do to dramatically change the situation we discussed? Two minutes, please. First of all, the one thing that we hear, and even in your question, Sherry, it's very clear. Same old, same old doesn't work. And that's what we've been promised. The problem is, if you continue to do what we're doing now, it's same old, same old. What we need to first get a grip on is what kind of businesses do we want to have in Hawaii, and who do we want to encourage to come here? You know, when you go to the mainland and you see places that have just boomed, a lot of it is due to tax credits. A lot of it is due to incentives. But more importantly than that, it is that workforce. Who is it that wants the jobs and if you're able to tie the business and the job together? Yes, different types of economic zones will work. But I think the most critical part of what we need to do to encourage businesses to come here is to be able to provide that workforce that they want to see and something unique about Hawaii. I've always felt the most unique thing about Hawaii is what we have to offer for research. Hawaii Island, for example, is the prime example of that. You have almost all ecosystems of the world here. That is why research companies want to do business here. This is why, for example, when we look at the telescope, it's such an important issue. These are all unique characteristics of Hawaii. What government needs to do, and what I would do as a governor, is, is to provide a navigator, somebody who could be a one-stop shop. So anyone who comes to invest in Hawaii, they can go to this one place and they can maneuver through not only the state system, but also all the county system. That is the only way we're going to share this reputation that we're a bad place to do business. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. And I'd like to give a 30-second follow-up to each of you on that question. And specifically, starting with you, Rep. Hanabusa, what is the very first thing you will do if you are elected governor to make a change in the business environment? Very first thing, 30 seconds only. I would create that navigator, the person or the entity or the place where people can go when they want to come to do business in Hawaii. Thank you. Governor Ige, the very first thing you're going to do if re-elected. Yes, certainly uh, promote and ensure that our Department of Business, Economic and Development uh, understands that small business is first and foremost. Uh, and then look at all of the different programs that we have to support small businesses and ensure that they are actively engaged and promoted to the community to help small businesses. Mr. LaRue, 30 seconds, your first step. Yes, ma'am. I would first look at the inhibitors and the barriers to small business at the entry. Start scraping away some of the immediate tax burden that a small business has to, why not have a graduated and phased approach to the GE tax, for instance, as a small business? Why do they have to be hit over the head right off the bat with the 4.2%? Wait till that small business gets on its feet and is prosperous, and then they can be phased into that tax base rather than waiting until they're almost at the failing point and then failing. Thank you. Rep. Tupola, your first action, 30 seconds, please, to make a difference in the business situation. Cutting taxes that are hurting them as well as making sure that we repeal unnecessary regulations. It seems so simple, but it's something that holds a lot of businesses back. There's a lot of unnecessary hoops that they have to jump through. And then, of course, immediately starting to open up vocational schools and vocational training in all of the high schools. Thank you very much. Governor Ige, we're going to go to you first for this question, which is a two-minute question. We all know we have unfunded liabilities, and when we hire someone into the state or county government, this is both sides of government, we are paying them to work for probably 30 years, and then with the pension system and the long life expectancy that we have these days, 
that may be that we're ending up paying them for another 30 years. So we're paying people for around 60 years. And that's just one example of why government spending is getting to be more than what we can afford, we the taxpayers. There are many solutions to this problem. We'd like you to take two minutes and talk about what one or two solutions to this problem will you support to help reduce our overall burden? And it's a two minute question. Governor Ige, you are first. Certainly, I would like to talk about the things that I've already done. We did uh, change the pension system um, more than five years ago where all new employees hired uh, after uh, June 30th, uh, 2012, uh, have a different pension system than those who started before. So we've reduced the pension benefit. We've increased the amount that the employees pay into the system. We've increased the retirement age. We've stopped pension spiking by not including overtime. Uh, and most importantly, we've required the employer to pay for any pension spiking. So we have fundamentally changed the old pension system that, that served state and county employees prior to 2012 with a new pension system that is more uh, sustainable and forward, um, affordable moving forward. So we have already seen significant reduction in the unfunded liability uh, of the workers. We do believe that with these changes already approved uh, in the pension system, our pension system is uh, fully sustainable. And I also passed a law that required us to pre-fund the liability for the health fund to ensure that we can keep our promises to state and county employees forever so that one, they, when they signed up for public service and they were promised pensions and health fund benefits uh, for the rest of their lives, we will have a system to do that. This year, for the first time, we are completing the first full payment uh, for the annual recurring cost for the unfunded liability for the health fund. This starts a process that will assure that both the pension and the health fund benefit will be funded uh, over the long haul so that all of our public servants will get the promises made a long time ago. Rep Hanabusa, government spending is getting to be more than what we think we can afford. So talk in two minutes about the solutions that you would support to change that situation, please. Are you talking about government spending or the pension fund? I'm We're talking ta about government spending, state and county, the pension fund is one example of that. There's, there's probably other things too, but that's up to you to tell us. Okay. Two minutes, please. Thank you. You know, government spending is one that people always look at and they say, why is government spending on those kinds of projects? So I think the most important thing that we have to first determine is what is the role of government? Government as an employer is one role. And government as an employer has its obligations in terms of the collective bargaining agreements that it has entered into, as well as the laws that we have enacted. And David is, is correct. We have changed the laws as it, it goes on. For example, my health care benefits when I entered in 1999 are very different from what David is entitled to because we changed the law to ensure that we could continue to be sustained. The other thing that government spending has got to take a, a really clear look at is what is it, what is it that we believe is so fundamental to government spending that we must do? I've always felt that the most important thing, like ARC, is to, to assist people who need help. But the question becomes, what else requires government to spend? I think it's going to take real thoughtful consideration, but a discussion with the legislature as to what is it that we don't need anymore? What is it that we don't have to continue to fund? I think the most important part about government spending is that we utilize every, for, every form of additional funds that we have accessible to us. For example, you don't let lapse when the federal government is threatening that they're going to cut you off because you haven't spent. That's what happened with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. President Obama cut it because this administration didn't spend. Same thing with all the highways. Look at our roads. Look at what's happening. 
we lose potentially those funding because it's Thank not you. spent. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. I'd like to turn to our Republican candidates. Mr. LaRue, government spending is pretty high. What will you as governor do? Give us two minutes to solve this problem. Sure. First of all, it's extremely high, and what you have to also understand, at least it's my belief, that your government should be your advocate to all of your hopes and dreams and certainly the aspirations of your children. But let's talk about the unfunded state liability that Sherry began the question with. $25 billion is an extremely large amount for such a small state. If you graph that out over the years, the last child in Hawaii has not yet been born yet that will take on that burden. If you further graph that out, look at state revenue, look at our population, look at, at just personal income, and all those market drivers will graph that curve to the, about the 100 to 200% over 10 years growth. If you look like at the overpromise of the state pension and, and health care that goes way out into 2040, it's almost a thousand percent. In other words, the state is not taking in enough revenue to meet that demand. Um, when you start looking at how we're going to pay that, we have to start slicing back and, and, and putting more into that pension system, or we're going to become in a nanosecond the state of Illinois, who right now has to make a decision in about two years whether they're going to pay their teachers or they're going to pay their pensioners, and we cannot allow this state to get into that position. To talk about government spending in a real sense, let's look at the capital budget as it pertains, say, to the Department of Education. It's a $450 million or half a billion dollar biennium budget, about 220 annually. When that gets submitted through the Board of Education and then through our legislature, let's say we trust the Department of Education for a minute that they have given us their most emergent needs. When that budget comes back out of the legislature, some of those emergent needs that, say, we trusted the DOE to come up with no longer exist. In fact, there's just planning money, design money, and the legislature has carved that scant capital budget up into so many pieces that we've become very good at getting at the 35% solution, but we're not getting to the 80 or 90% solution. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Tupola, government spending. Thank you. I think when we talk about the pension, we have to realize that we have taken some roads that are helping us. However, it is projected in the future that it's not going to be sustainable in the direction we're going. It's better, but we still need to tackle it. The first thing is that we need to talk about diversifying the investments. Many states have talked about it. I've seen some of the graphs of states of different types of ways that you can invest so that you can grow it. That's one um, conversation we need to have. Secondly, of course, making sure that employees can in contribute more and maybe even taking off the cap. Third is that you need to make sure to have those tough conversations at the negotiation table about future work promise so that that is realistic. And whatever we're doing now, we have to step it up because we need to get it in a better place, not just in the next five years, but project it out so that in the next 10 or 20, we can make sure to cover these pensions. And for those of you who are unsure about which jobs are actually gonna be affected the most with this, it's almost always your first responders that are gonna start to hurt with this, this unfunded liability issue. That's your police officers, that's your firefighters. The second thing about government spending that we have to re remember and realize, and I need you guys to say it with me, Cut waste. Can you say that? No, like say it like you mean it. Cut waste. Yes. Because what you have to do when you're trying to cut down your spending is you have to determine what is your inventory, so what do you have now, and what do you need. So we can't have this conversation and say, oh, we need more of this, we need more of that. We need to know what we have. And I'm saying that because in some of the areas in our state, we've seen that certain populations have started to move out. So now certain schools are under enrollment, certain schools have closed down. There are some agro-development full structures for agribusiness that are empty. So we need to make sure that anything empty, anything wasted, anything that we're not using, that we start to reallocate those resources Thank and you. spend better. However, I'm going to give each one of you one minute to expand on the whole issue of reining in government spending, not with an eye towards pensions, but other things. And we'll start with you, Rep Tupolo, one minute. When we talk about cutting waste, what we really mean is that we have contracts that have gone out. We have certain departments that have special funds 
that have been going for years and some of these funds are not actually still of the purpose that the fund was created for. It's something that we started to tackle in the finance committee. It's starting to study all the departments, 16 of them, and all of the different special funds and monies and pockets of where everything is and trying to streamline it. Making sure that we cut down government spending means that we have to realize that we're bringing in a lot of money with taxes, but we're still not producing enough. So what happens, you have to start to look at the operations and figure out how we can make it more efficient. Thank you very much. Mr. LaRue, one more minute on government spending, please. Yeah, and I'll go back to that capital budget because it, it really does personify the issue in some regards. So if you look at, for instance, your schools here in Hilo, that capital budget, by the way, which is, again, very, very fragile, very scant, the manipulation or otherwise oversight of that capital budget for schools in Hilo, schools on the Hawaii Island, actually Maui, Kauai, Molokai as well, is actually executed by a completely different department in the state called the Department of Accounting and General Services. So if you look at one size fits all Department of Education with its capital budget spending for facilities and repair and maintenance, why isn't it one entity spending and allocating that fund? It's two different government entities and the dysfunction in that causes the fraud and the waste and the abuse that Rep. Topola just mentioned. So you have to bring that into some sort of synergy your schools deserve it, your citizens deserve it, and our, certainly our children deserve having 21st century classrooms as well. Thank you. Rep. Hanabusa, one more minute, please. The first thing we have to do to cut government spending is to understand government waste. And when I say waste, I'm talking about when we have funds available. For example, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Department of Transportation, we knew we had funds there. And when we don't use them and when they lapse, what happens is that government spending goes up because it has to be made up some other way. So when we start to talk about government spending, let's first look at what is it that we're doing. Are we managing our money correctly? Are we managing what we need to do? And I would contend that we haven't. And that's why government spending goes up. Why, do we, why aren't we floating or using bonds that were there for a long time for airports? Airports modernization, for example, took place in 2009. So did, so did harbors. Why are we now funding it separately? Because we didn't pay attention. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. Governor David Egan, I'd like you to focus forward as you answer this one-minute question and expand a little bit, not on what has happened, but what you do plan to do in the next four years if you were reelected. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Sherry, but I do want to talk a little bit about what happened because I think it's important. I do take my job seriously in managing your taxpayer dollars. I have taken specific action as your governor that have saved you over the next 20 years more than $1.8 billion. So it's doing things that are smart, like making um, payments to our pension system early in the fiscal year, which allows it to get invested at a higher rate of return. It's about pre-funding the health fund, which will save you $1.6 billion over the next 20 years because we made a commitment that we are going to create a trust fund for the health fund, just like we do for the pension fund. And we've increased our bond rating to the highest level it's ever been because we've been efficient with your taxpayer dollars and I've refinanced bonds every year that I've been governor to save you hundreds of millions of dollars in interest payments going forward. Thank you very much, Governor Ige. We want to talk a little bit about housing and Mr. LaRue, this question is going to go to you first. It will be a two minutes two-minute question. And when we talk about housing, we don't want to talk about legally defined affordable housing because a lot of people talk about that. We want to talk about housing that the average person can afford if they are just a working person. And what happens is builders tell us that there's a lot of state and county regulations that make it really difficult to build homes that the average working person can afford, not the person who's qualified for legally defined affordable housing. So two minutes, please. What solutions can you suggest to make it possible for homes to be built on our island that people can afford to purchase? Two minutes, please. Certainly. Mr. LaRue. Absolutely. And, and first of all, I think you do have to get into the def definition a little bit. When you start talking about affordable housing, 
and the median price of a house in, in Hawaii is right now somewhere around 700,000. So does that mean affordable housing is now 400,000? You're not talking about people that are making 23,000, 30,000, 50,000 dollars a year being able to walk into that sort of environment. Let's talk about the Hawaii revolving fund, the rental fund. Just by definition, a revolving fund is a fund that's supposed to be replenished. In other words, there's revenue coming in that keeps replenishing that, rev that rental fund so that you can keep making those loans. To date, and this is 2016 data, but it, it still holds true, is that we only have been, been awarding grants from that fund, not making small loans, special loans to folks that could actually get into affordable housing. With that kind of a rental revenue, you'd be replenishing that. We just, I believe, in this legislative session, added two more, 200 million more, more in allocation to the fund and then tax breaks for developers going out for the next foreseeable future. The tax breaks coming to, going to developers really sets up that inequity of a tax base. That tax base is going nowhere, by the way, and that actually gets passed on to the rest of us that are paying taxes. So when you start looking at a rental revolving fund that gets replenished, but it doesn't have anything coming in, it makes it a little bit harder. So I would also say if you're looking at, let's take our teacher base as well. Going back to the pension, they have a compulsory payment to the ERS, the Employment Retirement System. What if they didn't have to do that? What if they had an opt-in? That gives them almost four to five, six, seven hundred dollars, depending where you are in that pay scale, a month that could put you in affordable housing or what you would consider affordable housing. So there's many things that you can do as the leader to, to relax some of those inhibitors right now that is not putting disposable income into your pocket to afford you. to live. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Rep Tupola, we're interested in housing for people who are working but may not qualify for legally defined affordable housing. Two minutes, please. How can you make it a little bit easier? One of the bills we talked about this year in the legislature was about cutting the permitting time. Currently, the state of Hawaii has one of the longest spans of time to get a permit to build. Does this affect the price of housing? Yes. Does it affect the ability for local to developers to want to enter into agreements to build? Yes, because nobody wants to get into an agreement, purchase land, and then not be able to get somebody on the land until years later when the permit comes. Cutting the permitting time is something that we have to talk about. We call it permit purgatory. The second thing is we have to help support more of our local developers and keep local dollars here. The reason I say that is because some of what our government does as well as what private you know, developers do is try to go out there and create the urban sprawl and make houses that look just like the mainland what we need to do is create community balanced development meaning that these community centers these community minded developments are based around making sure we have adequate roads that we have adequate schools that we have adequate emergency responders the third thing we have to do is make sure to understand whether or not we should be using more local building materials, something so simple, but yet we don't really talk about it, is that the high cost of shipping also affects the ability for us and to have houses that are affordable. The last thing is smart living. We talk about all of these different types of houses we want, but really our generation and this, this society is pushing into new footprints. If you've ever seen some of the new developments, one is called bento boxes, coming completely off the grid, building smaller houses that you can manage better, that you can have more land, that you can have a farm next to it. Smart living is a concept that is really helping some of the families build more affordable units and a more balanced lifestyle. Thank you. Governor David Ige. Certainly, Sherry. We have been working on a comprehensive uh, housing plan because we do know that we need housing at all price points. So uh, first, let's just talk about public housing. We have been looking at public-private partnerships with public housing so that we can uh, recreate uh, public housing that already exists and expand that. Public housing is focused for those making between zero and 30% of the area median income. So it is the lowest, most needy uh, people in the housing market. And we have a comprehensive program to look at all public housing and do public-private partnerships to expand the number of public housing units we have. That second tier is 30 to 60% of the median income. And that's where the low-income 
tax credits come available where we're working with public-private partnerships. Private developers are making uh, those affordable rental projects uh, with state support to subsidize the rentals uh, in that 30 to 60 uh, percent range. You know, the legislature's um, investment of $200 million in the rental assistance revolving fund helps us streamline and fast track many of these affordable rental projects in the 30 to 60 percent range. We are also making state lands available for affordable rentals all across the state. We've uh, asked the department to identify those parcels that would be available and would be good locations for affordable rental projects. The next level of housing is workforce housing. So that's most of the rest of us. We just passed a bill this session that created tax credits for those developers who are looking to, to build workforce housing. Uh, and the tax credits go for 10 or 15 years, I believe. Uh, we passed these tax credits available to developers. Uh, and everybody has given a little to make those units affordable. And Thank then you. there's market. Thank you, Governor Ige. Rep. Hanabosa, two minutes. Thank you. So when we start to talk about housing, we really do have to understand what kind of housing we're talking about and whether what our vision of housing is really what is shared. For example, when I made the uh, statement about those who are now millennials and asking them, what is it that you want to live in? Believe it or not, many of them do not want to live in the traditional homes. They have a totally different idea. It's not affordable housing, it's housing affordability. They're making decisions based on what percentage of their income are they willing to spend. And they're not willing to spend anything else. And they're willing to live in smaller units because that's how they choose to live. It's a lifestyle choice. However, when we're talking about government and what government can do, sometimes we have to look to the past and maybe say, hey, we did something right. I'm not saying that homes will be as was done, but for those of you, I know this is Hawaii Island, but those of you who know anything about Kapolei, who built Kapolei? The state did. It was an HFDC project, and they did a good job. They actually created a community. So when we talk about housing, we have to be concentrated on what is the ultimate objective. The ultimate objection to me is to have a community. And part of that community would be to include all kinds of housing with it. Whether we're talking about kupuna housing, whether we're talking about housing for millennials, whether we're talking about high-end housing, or we're talking about affordable housing or low-income housing. And whether you're talking about rentals or you're talking about purchase. But government has done this correctly in the past. Maybe it's time to look back, except say, we may not build the, the four-bedroom four bedroom house and the two-car garage, but we do know, and we have done it before. Thank you, Thank you Rep. Hanabu. So you mentioned initials HFDC. Would you like to define that for the audience? HFDC, there was an entity. Just, just was it, what it it's is? It's Housing Finance Development Corporation, which is now HHFDC. Thank you very much. I'd like to appreciate all of you here at the Ark of Hilo for being here, and I'd also like to welcome our audience listening live on KPUA 670 AM. Are you making signals to me, Ken Huff? Is that not what you wanted me to say? Yes. Did I? Oh, KPUA Hilo. I'm so sorry. KPUA Hilo. We're here at the Ark of Hilo, and our radio station is in Hilo. And I'd also like to welcome the audience that may be watching on the Facebook live stream and then tomorrow on BigIslandVideoNews.com. Rep. Hanabusa, we want to stay with housing, and I want to ask you about something that occurred in a previous candidate forum. The Honolulu Star Advertiser reported that in a debate in Waikiki in the first week of July, you said, quote, state government should consider developing housing for its own employees to relieve some of the pressure on the housing market should provide housing for government workers. Now clearly, that sounds like you're suggesting the taxpayers should pay for housing for all state workers. So could you just take 90 seconds and explain to us what you were meaning by that plan, by that statement in Waikiki? 90 seconds, please. Part of it is the concept of workforce housing. And it may not necessarily be a situation where you think that government's going to end up paying for additional housing. 
It is a situation where it could be part of an agreement. For example, my, when I was growing up in Waianae, because of the distance, most of my teachers lived in teacher housing. And that was part of the benefits that was afforded to them. And there should be a value place to that. And it can be part of the negotiations. As we all know, we are losing teachers. And there's people are asking why. And a lot of it is where they're going to live, whether they want to live. I feel, and I think I spoke to some principals today, I feel that maybe if we have a situation where teachers can be in a place for five years, they may become adapted to that community. Or if they knew they had housing in the community, they may be more willing to come back and live there and get their start. So yes, I think we, when we start to look at what are the incentives that we can offer our employees, especially teachers, first responders, people that we are losing, it probably will tie back to housing. So let's not just simply dismiss it, let's make it work within the system. 30 seconds, how would this be funded? As a taxpayer, we'd all like to understand that. 30 seconds, please. Well, it would probably be funded through whether we have a, a, an agreement with, with uh, any of the respective unions, but of course, it would probably be funded by, by the state in some form or another. And it's a decision that's going to have to be made. Is this an incentive that we need to keep teachers or to keep doctors, whoever it is that we feel we're losing? We're going to have to think outside of the box, and that's part of the compensation package. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Ige, to be fair on time, I will give each one of you two minutes to talk more about the housing shortage in the state and whether it's reasonable to provide housing for state workers or whether you have other ideas about how to improve our housing situation. Two minutes, Governor Ige. Um, we have had a comprehensive program for housing as I've talked about, uh, and it really has been focused on affordable rentals. And we know that when we look at all of the data that um, all across the state, we don't have enough affordable rentals. Uh, and so we have been focusing in this area. Uh, we've uh, change the low income tax credits to make it more of attractive to investors by reducing the investment period from 10 years to five years. And this has really increased the interest in the private sector. Uh, I do think that we should look at targeted workforce housing for teachers and other public servants, but it shouldn't be funded with taxpayer dollars. We can make um, programs available, state lands available like we do for affordable rentals uh, and allow state and county workers to have a priority for those shortage uh, categories. For example, um, teachers uh, in the Waianae Coast where we've had a tremendous difficulty attracting them or uh, teachers in like Lanai or Molokai where we've had a perennial shortage. Uh, so public and private partnership, working with developers, making state lands available, looking at existing programs that we already have for affordable rental projects like the uh, revolving uh, rental housing revolving fund would allow us to create win-win opportunities as long as the public employees qualify and meet the qualifications to receive uh, rental assistance just as any other uh, member of the public who would be applying uh, they would get a priority to uh, get those units uh, especially when we look at teachers in other areas where we ha are having a difficult time uh, finding employees to fill those jobs Thank you very much. Representative Tupola, two minutes more, please, on the housing situation, including, the, including government housing. Okay. Um, well, definitely our earlier conversation was about government spending. So we would have to consider that portion of it as well, since that is going to be shared equally amongst the taxpayers, probably a conversation that would be heavier than just here in this room. I do not think that at this point with where we're at in our government that it would be a wise step forward. But again, the conversation staying open for all options is what we're looking at. Secondly, is that I really, really, really like the concept of self-help housing. Not for everybody, but I can tell you that those communities that have adopted these models, I'll tell you what's happened in those communities, is that it brings families together who care about one another, 
who learn the skills, who can then upkeep their houses, and some of them have even gone off the grid and been able to not just have a house that appraises with equity in it, but that they can actually repair it and care for it and build other houses, because now they have gotten the skills in their tool chest that they can use to help others. Of course, of course, we need to talk about DHHL because we have many state lands designated for DHHL that could be housing more Native Hawaiians and has funding, but we don't see the houses coming up. Right here in Puna, with what we have with Maku'u, we have streets, we have lights, we have infrastructure, but we still have leases that have not been given out. So something needs to happen there because the pipeline of being able to expend down money that is there with land that exists with Hawaiians that are waiting, this is something that needs to be addressed yesterday, probably five years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. Because we shouldn't be promising anybody a house if we don't intend to build one. And so the last thing that I think about with affordable housing is that we really need to talk about electricity bills. Because right after that, then becomes why is the price of electricity so high in Hawaii? Everybody who lives here tells me that, is that once we solve that crisis, we need to immediately solve the highest amount of expenditure after mortgage. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. So when you start talking about the housing issue, public housing, let's just take that on for a minute. And if you're talking about the folks that live in that lower income bracket or that lower tax bracket, Public housing is not all that readily available in this state. In fact, there's a 20-year waiting list right now. If you start talking about HUD assistance with regards to federally mandated programs for housing, there's a 10-year wait just to get on the list. So, Governor's right, there's a very, very lack, a uh, big gap in the inventory. Um, if you also look at state revenue, and we cannot keep hitting you, the taxpayer, over the head, expecting to come up with another social program. Many of them work, many of them don't, and they cost too much. But if we start looking at the departments, there is no new revenue coming into the state. So if we want to build, if we want to provide workforce housing, teacher housing, we've got to find the funds within the budgets that already exist. What has to happen, and I firmly believe this, is some sort of fiscal transparency audit. A lot of people use the word forensic, but that connotes some sort of criminality, and I don't want to go there. But look at the money. You should know, as a taxpayer, where the money is going. And right now, we don't have a clear picture. When you listen to the different department heads within the state, when they are briefing to either the Ways and Means Committee or the Finance Committee, well, how much money do you need? They don't even know. They have to go back and we'll get back to you on that. When you start talking figures, 323 million for that program, 420 million for that program, those are big abstract numbers that a lot of people, to include some of our legislators, do not understand. With regards to teacher housing, yes, I think that's an incentive. Do I think that could be found within the existing budget? You bet. If you start looking at that capital budget and how we're spending it, where it's allo allocated wastefully and not efficiently, I do believe that we can get into that program and get it alive again. Mahalo. Thank, thank you very much. We want to stay with housing, but sort of on a different tack. And Governor Ige, we will begin with you, and it's a 90-second question. People have lost their homes and land to the Leilani lava flow. So 90 seconds. Does the state have an obligation to replace that land and those homes which have been lost? And if your answer is yes, give us a sense as to how it will be financed. 90 seconds, please. Certainly, there was a, a law passed in 1990 during the last Kalapana lava flow that um, many homes were uh, destroyed. And the law does allow for the state to exchange uh, state land with uh, those for those who lost their land due to the lava flow. So we are exploring this. So, you know, the question is, would I support something like this? Uh, yes, we've uh, had conversations um, with the federal government and um, the county putting together a vision for uh, housing for both short-term and long-term emergency housing of, of the residents displaced right now. Um, short-term looking, you know, zero to six months depending on uh, different programs that we can get um, completed. And then the long-term replacement, where does the housing development of the future goal. 
Uh, and we know that we did qualify for individual assistance from the federal government. Uh, and they do have funds that may be available to help us with this uh, land exchange that may um, qualify for the acquisition cost uh, of the new land. So it wouldn't necessarily be a burden uh, to taxpayers. You know, we're looking at uh, state, county, federal programs to provide assistance uh, to those who lost their lands in the lava flow. Thank you, Governor Ige. Rep. Hanabusa, 90 seconds, please. I'm not sure that I agree that the state has an obligation in terms of a legal obligation. Notwithstanding, I think the state has a moral obligation to do what it can do. Having said that, I think this section of the law that uh, David was referring to is section 171, if I remember correctly. And the reason why I remember that is simply because in, in 2001 or 2002, in that time frame, this law was used to take care of the Kalapana people. So it came up with this concept of Kikala Kiokea. When I was in the legislature and chair of Hawaiian Affairs, what we did then was we funded the infrastructure for Kikala Kiokea. I believe OHA participated with helping with the mortgage payments. And that was because we had a unique situation of Kuleana land rights. Having said that, it can still be utilized, but, but in order for it to be properly done and for people to get the homes that they want, the federal government, FEMA does not give as much money as it may be alluded to. It, it just doesn't do it. The state is gonna have to come up with some sort of program to allow for those payments, but more importantly than that, it's gonna have to make that decision as to whether the infrastructure is something that it will then accommodate. Thank you. Rep Tupola, talk about the state and post-lava flow land and housing. Today I had a great experience. I actually got to volunteer at Neighborhood Place of Puna, and there is where they do the intake forms for the people who want assistance or who are looking for help. And I had a great conversation with one of the members from Leilani Estates. And this is something that's at the heart of my message and what I've always done with my community members is included them in the decision-making process. And she said that it's one of the most disheartening things for the people in Leilani Estates to feel like they haven't been part of that conversation, to be able to determine what is a good way forward. Because part of it is covered with lava, some of it is just evacuated, maybe they can come back later, they're not sure, they're not sure how long it's gonna be. And as well, many of you guys know that the civil defense has taken over all of the law enforcement in that area and they feel powerless. They said some of the most stressful moments in our community is because the government is causing it, because we're not even in charge anymore. And so I would say my first step would be to sit with these community members and determine a path forward together. Because at the end of the day, we don't live there, they live there. And so we need to make sure that their voices are heard. One of the things that many of them brought up is that there are families that are ready to take advantage of that program, that want to already exchange their property and they're ready to go. But there are others that want to wait it out who are in the evacuation zone that might want to come back. Thank you, Rep. Tupola. Mr. LaRue, 90 seconds on post-lava flow housing and land. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think I have to apply kudos and job well done to the Puna community. Um, if you look at from a first responders aspect of things, you know, and I know Governor had a great first response. FEMA comes in as not a first respond, but they sit on state action that's already in place but a community engagement piece that happened and all of the, the aid and assistance that's going to the residents that have been displaced right now is really from a community-based effort. And that's what sets us apart from the animal kingdom is that, that morality, that, that we have to help. To Rep Hanabusa's point, do I think the state has an obligation? Maybe, but from a moral sense, you bet. And again, that's what sets us apart. But you have to ask the question, and, and this is the pragmatist in me, you know, how did Leilani Estates get built in the first place in Lava Zone 1? Is it going to be re rebuilt again? Where did they get the insurance for a lava inclusion clause in their insurance policy, or is there one? Those are the questions that you have to ask as we start going through the rebuild process. And by the way, the, the adrenaline of this situation is going to wear off very quickly. Those help centers are going to disappear. 
So we've got to come up with a plan that, A, helps the displaced people if they don't have any place to go because they lost everything because they didn't have an inclusion clause or they didn't have the insurance. Then that's when you start looking into the land swaps and is that a viable option? So right now, the community effort thank that has you. happened, I think, has been spectacular, and you guys all thank deserve you, a you, big you. round of applause for that. <laughs> thank you. I would like to refer you all, though. There is an article in Civil Beat written by Jason Armstrong on this island about post-housing for after Kalapana, and it was pretty enlightening about how that actually worked out. So I would urge you as our potential governor to also pay attention to that research that was done. You know, across the state, we are losing farms for a variety of reasons, and all of you have touched on agriculture. Sometimes rules make it harder to farm. Our farmers are getting older. The average age is about 70. Fewer family members are willing to take on that really hard job of farming. And of course, this situation existed before the lava flow, and now here on this island, our island's agriculture is suffering even more because there was a lot of agricultural land down in the now covered by lava area. Farmers are also suffering with ashfall and sulfur dioxide. So even though we absolutely applaud the idea of growing more food here, we do have some additional challenges. So I'd like you to take two minutes and talk about, starting with Mr. LaRue, two minutes, talk about what specifically can and should be done by the state to help the agriculture sector on this island. Two minutes, please. Certainly. I'm a big proponent of ag, especially the niche agricultural markets that this island specifically owns. And if you look at kind of the in, in, you know, inundation of all the things that Sherry just spoke of because of the volcano, the lava, your orchid uh, production, your papaya production, those markets are suffering um, greatly because of this event. If you talk to other farmers, and I've spoken to a number of them in the Waimea area, for instance, their production really hasn't squelched it all just because you know because they can't get it out it's government's permitting and finding those barriers to market and bringing them down if there's a they call it a food safe food safety or uh, i'm sorry uh, it, it, they have to be food safe certified in other words they want to grow their ag market it ship it even present it in schools if you will from a farm to table type environment you have to be food safety cer certified or inspected there's only one or two inspectors in Honolulu that have to come out to Hilo, Waimea, any of the other ag producing areas of the Big Island. That one or two person, you know, group of folks that come out and do that, they can't keep up with that. In other words, if we, the state, we, the government, have put these inhibitors on farmers to get their produce to market, yet we don't provide the opportunity for them to have that, that pathway, well then, we better start relaxing some of those barriers so that they can get their produce to market. When we start looking also at the farm to table or school, we don't produce enough produce on this island or the other islands to put in schools. We serve 100,000 meals a day. We're the only school district in the nation that serves 100% breakfast, 100% lunch, and after school meals. There is just not enough, so we do have to import that, but we do rely on local ag business, but if we can't get them the help they need to get that produce or that ag produce or product into the markets, then Thank we you. have failed as a state. Thank you, Mr. You bet. Rep Tupola, please take two minutes and talk about how you plan to help our agriculture sector, if you are governor, what our state should be doing. Two minutes, please. So one of the things we should understand is that the Department of Agriculture gets less than 1% of the state budget. And many farmers, many ranchers, many agriculture enthusiasts have shared this with me, that if we do intend to even try to diversify our economy or even bring up the type of agriculture activities that we do in this state, that we have to invest in it. Because in some of these areas where there are farmlands, and remember, there's a difference between ag land and cropland. So there is cropland where you can actually grow things. There's ag land where they graze, where ranchers use it. So the cropland that we're talking about is where they need the infrastructure. This is where the irrigation streams, some of the ditches, some of the areas in the island that are actually 
common areas, meaning that it is not owned by a rancher or a farmer. It is the state's responsibility to upkeep it and to make sure that it's actually usable by all of the farmers in the area. Those are the things that we're responsible for. But we cannot expect the Department of Agriculture to do this with nothing, no funding, and no ability to start that initiation of some of the necessary infrastructure. We have rebuild rural grants that we haven't applied for on the federal government. We have lots of capabilities of what we can actually start to help some of these farmers with, but we haven't taken those steps. And we need to, because we are an island. And because when there are emergencies and the shipping doesn't arrive here, then where are we going to go? We need to have at least more food production here to sustain more of the population in the event of an emergency. The last thing is that farmers all over have told me that if we invest more in the Department of Agriculture, that we should also invest more in the study of invasive species and the bugs that are killing some of the plants and crops that we need so desperately here in our state. Thank you very much. Governor Ige, please address the question about what the state can do to help our agriculture sector on this island, please. Certainly. We have been uh, looking at and working with uh, public and, and private sector landowners here, uh, especially in light of the eruption, to identify those lands that can be made available for the various agricultural sectors, you know, papaya, banana, the florals, the orchids, uh, and all of those. Uh, trying to identify which lands can be made available, whether it be county, state, or private sector. Uh, we initiated a low interest loan program for farmers so that they can borrow money uh, and they don't have to make any payments uh, back to the state until they return to production. So no payments are required so that we can make that investment. I know that many farmers are reluctant to look at loans. Uh, they don't choose to, but obviously this is an emergency situation. Uh, and we look to providing uh, low interest loans to get them restarted. And you know, we also are looking at livestock and making, uh, looking for parcels, public and private, again, that can suitable for livestock. I know that we've had extensive discussions on the state lands uh, surrounding Kulani a Prison. They used to have quite an active agricultural program up there. Uh, and so there might be existing infrastructure that could be made available to the farmers uh, with livestock needs. Um, then we definitely look at investments uh, in infrastructure, water or other infrastructures that whether it be a state or other lands would be necessary. Um, we talked about food safety and security, again, for food production, uh, being able to support farmers in dealing with um, food and safety and security. We need to invest uh, in the University of Hawaii and the Department of Agriculture. You know, I, I have continued to ask and seek increased investment. Our university and Department of Agriculture need to be engaged with the industry. Thank, Thank you. you. Rep Hanabusa, two minutes, please. Thank you. You know, in 2014, uh, when we were here, Puo event was also, at that time, flowing. And as you know, the Fisher 8, which is Leilani Estate, is believed to become another event. So it's, it may be a more permanent situation that, than many are, are anticipating. Having said that, in 2014, I had the opportunity to meet many of the farmers in the Kapoho area. And it's not as simple to simply move them. 80% of our papaya in the state is in the Puna Kapoho area. 50% is Kapoho. They farm differently. And I never understood this before. The way they farm is in the lava. It isn't in dirt, like those who have leases with the shipment estate. So what they need, and the way they are accustomed to farming, is they need something comparable. The other issue that they will tell you when you speak to these farmers, especially those who are doing ornamentals or orchids, is that where they are in terms of the ecosystems on this island determines what they can grow. So for many of them, they are debating whether or not they are going to continue. The farmers will tell you what they want from us in government is to know what their future is. Will they be able to go back to Kapoho, which is probably not? Will they be able to get comparable land to what they're accustomed to farming in that area? 
And these are difficult questions. My advantage is my uh, cousin is uh, the CTAR, ex he was the CTAR extension person here. So he knows all of them and his name is Kelvin Sewaki. And Kelvin is the one who has brought forth many of these farmers. And you know what? They just want to know. They want to know what government can do for them. Thank you very much, Rep. Hanabusa. Rep. Tupola, we are going to turn to you first for the next question, which is a two-minute question that relates to our health care. We have one private hospital here on the island in Waimea. We have two state hospitals, one in Kona and one right across the street here. Hilo Medical Center serves <coughs> excuse me, some of the most economically challenged populations of the state and certainly of this island. They serve the entire Ka'u, Lower Puna, Upper Puna, the entire East Hawaii. And these hospitals, our state hospitals, Kona and Hilo, have to move into the 21st century and begin offering better health care, even though they offer great health care now. What are your thoughts about the two state hospitals and how this will best happen? Are you thinking public-private partnerships, full privatization, full public state support? There are many options on how to make this happen. And this is not a new question. So, two minutes. Rep Tupola, you are first. Thank you. I definitely think that because we have a huge need for health care, not just here in this area, but all over, and we're starting to see that some of these hospitals are not sustainable. We had this conversation at the legislature about a year, two years ago, with Maui Memorial Hospital, and they were in dire straits. They needed to be able to get back into the black, and the state made the decision to go into a, a privatization. Is that what needs to happen here? That conversation needs to be had once we inventory and decide at what breaking point is the state hospital here? Is it at the point where we need to do that? Or do we start to look into some options of increasing the amount of access? So these are two separate issues. One is helping the hospitals to rehabilitate and become the hospital for everyone, or being able to bring the services out to communities that are farther out. What we have in our community is community health centers. We've seen this more successful in increasing bed spaces because they're smaller to operate, easier, and more local so that more people can access the services. Community health centers are not new to our island and neither are they here, but do we need more of them because of the long distances that it takes for people to access the health care? The second conversation that we've had at the legislature that needs to be taken very seriously is ambulances. Still right now in Puna, when you call the ambulance, the report time is about an hour that you wait until somebody comes and responds. Again, that's because we have this centralized concept of healthcare instead of a decentralized method that is going to be able to help more people. The last thing we should consider is that we need more physicians and health care providers. Many of them are leaving the state. Many of them think that it's too hard to practice here, dependent on things in the legislature. We have a loan repayment program that we should all be aware of that the state should fund. The federal matches it dollar for dollar, and it repays for doctors who want to get medical repayment for their school and work in rural communities. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to tell me, though, relative to, let's say, Hilo Medical Center, because we're standing right next to it, it needs assistance, and would you support full state support, privatization, public-private partnership? You have three choices. What is, what's your option? What's your best option? I think public-private partnership would be a great way forward because right now we currently have a lot of public support. Is it okay. enough? Thank we you. need to determine that. Mr. LaRue, our hospitals, our state hospitals specifically, and our focus is how they need to move forward into 21st century care and whether it's privatization, public-private partnerships, state support, two minutes. When I first became aware of the access to health care on Hawaii Island, it was really talking to the people in West Hawaii, Kona, and then certainly in, in what they call themselves Central Hawaii or up in the Waimea area. And to somebody like me, when you start talking access to health care, you know, the cost of it, or can you get into a health care program, what I didn't realize was it was actually the availability of health care to be provided. So I did a little bit more analysis. And those people that grew up on Hawaii Island and understand rural medicine, you grew up with that and you understand it. It's the folks that 
are moving to communities on Big Island that expect that they're going to have a level one trauma center down the road when in fact you're not going to. In fact, you're just going to have rural medicine. If you do a census and you looked on Hawaii Island, for instance, I think there were 12 major third degree burn cases last year. But to keep a burn specialist on staff at any one of the hospitals is almost a, a, a cost that you can't bear to do. So how do you do that? If you're a woman with an at-risk pregnancy, and say you're the breadwinner, say you have two children at home, you're going to Honolulu and you're going to wait out that pregnancy in Honolulu when in fact your family is still here. And again, if you're the breadwinner, you're putting your family at risk. So what's the answer for that? I don't think it's private-public partnership. You actually can look at that. But to have a private-public pu partnership that actually works, there's got to be benefit on both sides. And when you start talking to the private folks that do private medicine, they can't afford physicians or specialists to come in and be in a rural area. So I think if you have the state-run hospitals, the state has to get involved. And if you talk to folks that know the, know the, the, uh, the problem, it's because Hawaii Island does not have a certificate of need for that type level of care on the island. And some say that it's just not, ex it's not fiscally responsible to do that. And I'm like, you know what? It's 2018. This is Hawaii Island. This is one of the 50 estates. They deserve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rep. Hanabusa, please give us your thoughts about how to go forward with our two state-run hospitals. I have to tell you, one of the most important things about doing anything in government is to not accept same old, same old, but to go to the people who really know what's going on. I'm very fortunate in, in the front row is Dr. Ruth Matsuura, who for many, many generations have taken care of of the children of this state. And her son, Dr. Peter Matsura, is somebody who was the orthopedic, at one time the only orthopedic on this island. So you would think, well, definitely, what, what do we do now? We have to think outside of the box. Public-private partnership or privatization, per se, is probably not the answer. But there is something else. And when you talk to the doctors themselves and to hear them and how energized they are about a prospect, I think it's incumbent upon us to explore it. And that is, that is, why can't UH Hilo, for example, the, I mean Hilo Hospital, become a teaching hospital? Why can't it do that? Why can't it make partnerships either with JAPSOM solid partnerships or with with the universe a UC system somewhere and have them come in I do know University of Washington is looking in the Kona side at, at Nelha to do a certain kind of training there because they feel that Hawaii Island is the best place to do all of this so let's explore that if we can say go and find the students from Japsom or elsewhere to come here and you become a teaching hospital as well. And with eyes, eyes to having your own students stay here, the way you would do that is to have them become part of the community and or to return to this community. So I think the solution is not the traditional ones that we've been discussing, but let's think outside the box and let's look at what would be attractive to everyone. Thank you. A real brief follow-up. Rep. Hanabusa, you know that UH Hilo has a family medicine residency practice. We have residents here. How would, give me 30 seconds, how would that be different from what you're proposing since we already have that? We're thinking of a complete training hospital. Make, okay. make it more than just family. And, and to go out to other university systems like the UC system was okay. expressed an interest in this. Thank you very much. Governor Ige. Certainly. Let me just start by saying I think when you look at um, Hilo Medical Center, uh, it's entirely different than Maui Memorial. So I know that people like to make the, the comparison, but you know, when I look at Hilo and I look at Maui, uh, you know, Hilo is a lot better managed and run. Uh, we don't see the escalating cost at Hilo that we saw at Maui. You know, the cost, the subsidy was increasing significantly. So. The good news, I think, is that Hilo uh, is much better managed and, and uh, the subsidy that the state provides is much more stable. You know, I'm the only governor that actually had to do a transition from a state-run hospital to a private hospital. Uh, and clearly, the cost um, escalated as the project went along. 
Uh, and so it is a very expensive um, proposition. I think most importantly, it really has to engage the community. The community needs to involve, be involved in what that solution will be for healthcare uh, here in the Hilo community. Uh, and so I know that I've had uh, discussions with the members of uh, the board of directors here in the Hilo region to talk about different options. I know that they've explored different partnerships. You know, that clearly has to be something that uh, engages the community, uh, both the physicians and service providers, as well as uh, the medical center and the board and, and the business community. Uh, and they need to collectively, Hilo community need to collectively move forward. You know, I do think that the residency program here is the prime example, and we need to do more residency programs on the neighbor islands. You know, I was glad to support the Hilo uh, residency program. I know that doctors w do tend to set up their practices in the community that they do their residency, and I'd like to see that expanded. Uh, and I think we need to incorporate the FQHCs, which do a terrific job of providing care. And that would be the federally qualified health centers, such as Bay Clinic, for example, and those kind of places. Completely different topic, going to you, Rep. Hanabusa, first 90 seconds. 30-meter telescope, the decision on its being able to go forward is right now before the Hawaii State Supreme Court. 90 seconds, if approved, how will you specifically ensure the safety of those who need to bring TMT to fruition on the mountain? 90 seconds. The TMT issue has unfortunately gotten to the point where you have such diverse interests, but more importantly, legitimate interests in the sense that Native Hawaiians do have the right to practice and to, and to actually go there and, and exercise their, their rights. However, having said that, it is also a decision that it clearly impacts Hawaii Island, and more importantly than that, needs to be treated as a, quote, a legal right. So once the, once the Supreme Court makes its decision, and in addition to that, once the sublease component of it is also done, I would like to first have the opportunity to talk to those Native Hawaiian communities, in particular the homestead communities that I believe have the rights to the Mauna. Remember, 50% of Mauna Kea is Hawaiian homelands, and that's part of the 1920-21 when it received the 203,000 acres. And hopefully with that transition, we will be able to work things out. If it fails, which I know this will be her next question, if it fails, then we must fulfill our obligations as a state to the construction of the TMT. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. Governor Ige, if 30-meter telescope is approved, 90 seconds, how will you ensure safety of the folks who need to get it built? You know, certainly. Uh we have, I have been working with Mayor Kim on um, a new vision for Mauna Kea, which really expands uh, rather than it just being um, a place for astronomy to include science uh, as well as um, a symbol of peace. Uh, we have been having um, a lot of discussions with a lot of stakeholders in the project. I do know as governor, it would be my responsibility to ensure that everyone's uh, rights and legal entitlements would be enforced and so I would proceed to do that. Uh, we convened the last time a statewide law enforcement coalition including um, police, Hawaii County Police as well as other police departments all around the state to really talk about a comprehensive plan to ensure the safety of everyone protesters and their ability to protest, as well as other construction workers and anybody involved with uh, executing on the permit. We would once again um, have to convene that panel. As you know, uh, Sherry, there's a nuanced um, difficulty. Uh, we know that Hawaii County Police is definitely involved with the eruption activities, uh, and they are working overtime and very much involved in different ways. We would really have to look at what assets are available statewide and put together a plan that would assure everyone's safety. Thank you very much, Governor Ige. Rep. Tupola, if approved, how would you ensure their safety? Well, I really think that we need to talk about 
the bigger issue, which is the management issue, because safety is involved with the fact that there is no current system or authority to enforce the law. So if you look at the auditor's report, first one, 1998, second one, 2005, third one, 2014, fourth one came out in 2017. Those four auditor's reports say exactly what needs to be fixed in the management that's still the same. So the lease was given 65 years ago to the University of Hawaii, and that's coming up for discussion. So the Supreme Court case is one. There's another Supreme Court case, and then there's the issue of whether or not the lease will get renewed. But the underlying issue is that we still don't have a good management structure. Should UH be managing the mountain? Well, the auditor has already said there's eight specific things that UH should do in order to be a better steward of the mountain. Has UH done it? No. So should we consider if UH should be the managing entity? Could we even proceed with the lease if there's no authority to actually enforce the law? No administrative rules have been made for Mauna Kea. Every entity within the state is required to make administrative rules so that there is a way that you proceed and this is why it was so chaotic. And if those administrative rules never get made and if the management doesn't get addressed, then we're going to end up at the same problem all over again. So that's where we need to start the discussion. Thank you. Mr. LaRue. Well, I will be transparent and say that I am a fan of the 30-meter telescope, and I think it should be fast-tracked. Where I think we've gone wrong is that, to Rep. Topola's point, the messaging through the university and the messaging with the Native Hawaiian community on the mountain has been bungled from the start. If you look at diversifying our economy with another base industry, which is in the tech sector, I believe the telescope is absolutely paramount to connecting to that tech sector. I also believe that when you start looking at what that can do for Hawaii Island and the economy on Hawaii Island, it is a boon for the state. It puts the state on the map with regards to being in the leading edge of that kind of technology. When I spoke to some of the folks that were in protest of this, it wasn't so much the telescope, it was where the telescope's being built. If you look at the insult to the Aina, that some of the trash, the telescopes that are up there that are not being used, that have not been cleaned up. So from a management perspective, yes. Changing administrative rule within the state, you've almost got a better chance of changing your birth date. So you've got to find a better path to how this gets executed. So 30 meter telescope, yes. Have we messaged it incorrectly? You bet. And I think that has to be reinvigorated. You have to sit down with all the stakeholders. And at that point, I think we can start that discussion again. But I am, I am a fan of the 30-meter telescope, and I believe that it's good for Hawaii Island. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Governor Ige, I'm going to go to you first on this question, which is a one-minute question. Sorry, it's a big question. You only have one minute, though. You recently signed a bill to create the Hilo Economic Community the Hilo Community Economic District, and that is intended to solve the problem of Banyan Drive, Kanoe Lehua Industrial Area, which because it was state leases, nobody was willing to put the money into fixing up their properties because the state lease was too short. And this is a great short-term solution, but in another 45 years, we're going to be facing the same issue again. So one minute, please. What do you think a long-term permanent solution is? I know the audience is interested because this is very germane to our home here. One minute. Certainly, I do believe uh, we should be like any other landowner, really um, having policies and rules in place that encourages uh, investment by the lessee uh, into the property so that uh, the land and the uh, buildings on it can continue to, to uh, increase in value as we go along. I've uh, had many conversations with tenants in the Kanoi Lehua uh, Industrial District about the things that they uh, believe would be helpful. I do believe it is about creating a, uh, a way for any lessee to make investments in the property and get a lease extension. That's what happens in private leases, you know, and that way uh, the lessee would have an incentive to make investments to keep his uh, property um, valuable, and most importantly, then we would extend the lease appropriately. Thank you, Governor Ige. Rep. Hanabusa. I think the most important thing to know is that if you're a, if you're a business and you like where you are and you are leasing, you really do want to buy. 
and you would love to have a fee simple interest. Irrespective of whether these lands are ceded or not, the state does have the opportunity and the ability to swap lands. So one of the things I would go to the tenants and the lessees is to tell them, find comparable land. It doesn't all have to be together. Find comparable land that the state can benefit from and let's swap. And then you can then have the interest in fee. So 45 years from now, you won't have this issue. The beauty of that is the fact that you do not have to then discuss whether or not the lands are ceded or, or whatever it may be because the corpus of the lands of the state will basically be comparable and remain the same. Thank you, Rep. Hanabusa. Mr. LaRue. So just by nature, I'm a, I'm a less government kind of guy. So when you start looking at Hawaii County lands and then partnering with the state by developing some sort of industrial zone, all I need to do is point you to some of the authorities that have been created uh, on Oahu and some of the fist fights that are now occurring because some of the permitting or some of the other issues with regards to development that is happening on Oahu. I think the state can be an exact good partner or a critical friend to Hawaii County, but I do not think that we should be inventing new zones or economic zones, getting the state's business within the county business. You should have all the authority, permitting, development, etc. Again, I would point you to some of those uh, mistakes that have been made on Oahu, and they have not done very well, in my estimation, with regards to where the inequities happen with developers, and then certainly what the intent was for that authority to be uh, proposed in the first place. So, less government. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rep Tupola. Thank you. I think that many areas that the state owns, that people are leasing from, they're very frustrated because this type of facilities that they're trying to lease are way beyond the point of what they would want to invest in it, knowing that they can't stay there or knowing that they may not get their lease renewed. I do believe that the state needs to come up with a threshold of how they will upkeep their properties before they rent it out. And that, that's not just in Kanoi Lehua, that's all over. That's the airport hangars, that's the harbors. Most of the time, the state is bringing in tenants and asking them to do everything from putting in the infrastructure to laying the water pipes to bringing in the electricity. I'm not, again, specific to Kanoi Lehua, no, but specific to all the state lands, yes, we definitely expect a lot from our leases to do leaps and bounds without helping. So I do believe we need to bring that level up on the state side to at least help. If we want to help small businesses, this is what we need to do. If we want to help economic development, this is what we need to do and to improve our state facilities. Thank you very much. And we are now at the point of the evening where each of our candidates gets a two minute closing statement. And the luck of the draw, meant that Mr. Ray LaRue will go first with his two-minute closing statement. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Hilo, for having us back. Um, in case you came in from town and you saw all the, the Governor Ige and Colleen Hanabusa signs coming up, I think my signs are further up the road, so if you want to go home the long way, they're glow-in-the-dark signs and you'll be able to find them. Um, I got into the race late. And I got into it for a specific purpose, and I've heard the term up here, same old, same old, because I saw the choices and the options that you as voters had as just that, the same old, same old. I am the only candidate up there that has not had a direct hand in putting us in the situation that you find ourselves in now. I also find, and I believe, in the political process. I do. I think and I applaud everybody that steps up to the plate and tries and wants to make a difference. But when you look at a two-party system that doesn't exist in this state, I thought that you have to have a choice to make that process go. If you look at the, the charter of the League of Women's Voters, they want you to be engaged in that process. So when I looked at the, the, uh, the, the landscape and saw that you didn't have that choice, you didn't have that freshness of voice, you didn't have citizens like me wishing to step up. People tried to talk me out of it, but I believe I can make a difference. I believe I bring a different sort of statesman-like leadership that is sorely needed in the state. As a Marine, uh, you know, we kind of run through walls every now, but really our point A to point B, that short distance, is how do you get mission accomplishment and how do you make it work? When I air got airlifted in the school bus transportation issue back in 2012, the legislature had just cut funding drastically. We canceled, stu uh, we canceled routes for 2,000 kids. You have to go in and look at where we went wrong. And it's really 
It's not about the money. It was all about the money. Fiscal transparency through the entire government. You as taxpayers should be able to see where that tax dollar is going. Right now, you can't. So I promise fiscal transparency in a government that works and is your best advocate. Mahalo. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Representative Tupola, two minutes, please. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, and I hope that it was informative. And for those of you who want to know more, um, my website is votetupola.com, and it has more information there. When I first got involved, I really was a mother, a teacher, somebody from the community that just wanted to make a difference. And everybody told me, there's no way you're gonna break into the political system. It's almost impossible. You're a nobody, no one knows who you are. And when we ran out in YNI, one of the things that I really, really messaged to my community is that I was there to serve them. I didn't have my own agenda. I just went out, knocked door to door, and I asked the people, how can I serve you? What is it that our community needs? And you know, some people were shocked. They said, oh, usually politicians come here and they have all the answers. I said, no, I want to know from you what you think needs to be better in this community. And then I want us to work together. Empowering the people of Hawaii can only be done by somebody who has a vision and believes that the solution lies within the people, not within the government. The government is there to assist, to aid, but really, the difference we're going to see is when we see communities all throughout the state activated and told that they can be part of the solution and told that their opinions matter and that we're going to fold that in because who stays longer, a politician or a community member? Community members are there through the thick and thin. They're there through generations. And what we've seen is intergenerational poverty. We've seen root systemic issues not get addressed. And I'm running to address some of that with a new paradigm and a new perspective. And I humbly ask for your support. Thank you, Rep Tupola. Representative Colleen Hanabusa, two minutes, please. Thank you, and thank you for staying with us. And thank you to the listeners of KWXXFM and KPUA Hilo, I think I got that right, and anyone else who's watching us. You know, over the course of the last several weeks, I've had talk stories and I've had rallies in every county and I've been touched, really touched by the overwhelming warm responses that we've received, especially here on July 3rd at the Nani Mile Gardens, filled to capacity, something that I just did not expect. You all have a very important decision to make and that decision is which one of us you'd like to see as the next governor of the state of Hawaii. And I hope that that answer is driven by what kind of Hawaii do you want? I hope that our vision statements have made it clear to you as to what motivates each and every one of us. And I'd like to give a shout out to Andrea for one reason. Don't you think it's ironic that the two women are from the Waianae coast? And, and, I, and I share that because, you know, I've been criticized for being, for being critical or for being tough. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, when you grew up where we have and you're scrapping all the time, yes. But the one thing that I absolutely believe in is in the facts. And I like sharing facts. And many of you who know me know that that's something that has always motivated me. You know, as governor, I pledge to take faster action to build affordable housing, to be more innovative in providing more shelters to the homeless families, improve the state's rundown highways and harbors, and I commit to no more blank checks for rail. But this is what it's about, and I hope you will support me in this upcoming election. Mahalo, everyone. Thank you. Governor David Ige, two minutes. No applause till we're done, please. Uh, thank you. I just really wanted to, uh, first of all, thank all of the community organizations that sponsored this forum. I think it's a terrific opportunity for all of you to see the four candidates uh, running for governor and be able to hear us respond to questions that you care about all together and see the differences uh, that we have. You know, I am proud to be your governor, governor of the state of Hawaii. Uh, and we have done so many great things together. 
you know, this election is about the future of Hawaii and about what kind of future you would like to leave to your children and your children's children. You know, there has been a question of leadership, and I'm proud of the leadership that I have been able to really lead this state uh, and lead the country and the world in so many areas. You know, I'm proud of the fact that our unemployment rate is 2%, the lowest in the country, not only the lowest in the country, the lowest in the history of the United States. You know, the, the economy is running. We've had six record years of visitor arrivals and visitor spending. You know, we uh, anticipate a seventh record year in spite of the eruption and, and the compression that's occurred. I'm proud that we are the only state committed to 100% clean renewable energy and the only state to commit to the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement because I know that climate change is real and if we don't take real action right now in reducing greenhouse gases, we're going to be in trouble as a planet. You know, I, as governor, have joined the U.S. Climate Alliance with other governors, Democrats and Republicans, committed to ensure that we continue to advocate on behalf of all of you. You know, this election is about the future of Hawaii, and I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish together. And I humbly ask for your support on August 11th. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much. And before we say aloha, let me just say thank you to our sponsors, Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce, and particularly their executive director, Miles Yoshioka, who does it all seriously. He does get applause. He's definitely my brother from another mother. Miles is awesome. Also, the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Hawaii Island Realtors, Hawaii Island Contractors Association, the Big Island Press Club, Hawaii Island Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, the Kanoe Lehua Industrial Area Association. Special thanks to KPUA 670 AM, Hilo, and to Chris Leonard, G. Cruz, and Ken Hupp, and Facebooking, thank you, KWXX. Special thank you to Mary Bajir and Glenn Kagimaida. I am so sorry, Glenn. One of these days, I'll pronounce your name absolutely properly. Give me another chance someday. And a really big thank you to our candidates for running, because this is a really hard job. Thank you to our voters, our listeners, for being here. Thank you so much. Aloha. Chad.